In many classrooms around the world, TOK confuses the s*** out of people. There is a lack of understanding of what constitutes TOK and what doesn't. The number one reason why marks are massively lost in TOK essays is because they may be good and eloquent and convincing, but they're not really TOK. That's also the major reason why teachers sometimes mark your essay at an 8 or a 9 out of 10, and the mark that comes back from IB examiners is like a 2 or a 3 out of 10. Teachers feel extremely surprised and frustrated with this, but most frequently that is the reason. They think that what they're looking at is a TOK essay, but it isn't. I feel like this distinction between TOK and non-TOK, between first order questions and second order questions, between questions about the world and questions about knowledge, should be exercised and reinforced more and more. For this reason, I decided to try starting this series of videos that will each contain two examples related to a knowledge question, one TOK and one non-TOK, but it could look deceptively TOK-ish. Your job is to spot which one is the TOK one, and at the end of the video I will explain what I think. Without further ado, let's go and try it with an example. One of the TOK essay prescribed essay titles in November 2021 was We're rarely completely certain, but we're frequently certain enough. Discuss this statement with reference to two areas of knowledge. I will give you two examples and link them to this question. One of these examples is going to be, I think, a suitable example that can be used in a TOK essay and an effective link to the essay title. And the other example is going to be, I think, inappropriate and running the risk of getting zero marks. Let's see if you will agree with me on which one is the appropriate one and why. My first example is Tversky and Kahneman's pioneering research on cognitive biases and heuristics. In Kahneman's best-selling book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which you probably have heard of and chances are even read recently, Kahneman summarizes several decades of research and explains the difference between System 1 thinking and System 2 thinking. System 1 thinking is quick and intuitive, it is designed for snap judgments under uncertainty and limited time based on our previous experience. System 2 thinking is the deliberate, logical, rational system that applies careful logical reasoning and analysis to arrive at decisions that are rational and well justified. For example, suppose you are playing chess against an experienced player and you have limited time to decide on your next move. You are only starting the game, but the layout on the board is already complicated. You could carefully think about each of your possible moves, calculate risk and opportunities, anticipate the most probable moves of your opponent and compare alternatives, which is what chess playing computer programs do. Or you could go with some simplified rule that seemed to work in the past, so you might as well try to rely on it now. For example, from your past experience, you know that it usually pays off to move your pawns forward if you are unsure what to do. So you move your pawn forward. These simplified rules are called heuristics. Heuristics are a part of System 1 thinking. The thing about heuristics is, yes, they are simplified, and so in some cases they will lead to decisions that are not optimal or not completely rational. That's the bad thing about heuristics. However, they also save us loads of time and energy. You don't want to use System 2 every time you make a decision. That would quickly overload your brain, making your life impossible. So you need to delegate routine tasks to an autopilot which in this case is your system one that is full of simplified heuristics. They are not perfect, but they worked in the past, so chances are they are good enough. Most if not all decisions we make are by definition influenced by system one thinking. First you make a quick intuitive decision, and then if you think the situation is important enough, you override it with logical system two thinking and correct it if necessary. So, coming back to the essay title, we are rarely completely certain, but we are frequently certain enough. Yes, we are rarely completely certain because we predominantly use heuristics in everything we do and all problems we have to deal with. System 1 and System 2 act sequentially. First the first one, then the second one. And yes, 
we're frequently certain enough because in most cases these simplifying decision rules are good enough for us to achieve sufficient accuracy, good enough to carry on. And I have used an example from psychology, a human science, to demonstrate this. Do you think it's a good example or a bad example? Give it a thought, but before giving you my answer, I will move over to my second example. So the essay title is, we're rarely completely certain, but we're frequently certain enough. My other example is also related to psychology and heuristics. One of the most famous heuristics from which Tversky and Kahneman started their research program is the framing effect. In a famous experiment, Tversky and Kahneman asked a group of students to consider a hypothetical situation where there has been an outbreak of an unusual disease which is expected to kill 600 people. The student has to assume the role of a decision maker who has to choose one of two strategies depending on anticipated outcomes. Students in the experiment were randomly split into two groups which were given an identical description of the hypothetical situation but the predicted outcomes were different. The first group chose between strategy A and strategy B. Strategy A said 200 people will be saved and strategy B said there is a one-third probability that 600 people will be saved and a two-thirds probability that no people will be saved. The second group chose between strategy C and strategy D. Strategy C said 400 people will die. Strategy D said there is a one-third probability that nobody will die and two-thirds probability that 600 people will die. Looking at these strategies, you notice that they are logically the same. If you expect the disease to kill 600 people, saying that 200 people will be saved is the same as saying that 400 people will die. So strategy A and C are logically the same. And one-third probability that 600 people will be saved is the same as two-thirds probability that nobody will die. So strategy B and strategy D are also logically identical. These are all the same outcomes. The only difference is that some outcomes are riskier than others and some outcomes are formulated in terms of gains while others are formulated in terms of losses. Apparently though, they are identical logically, but not psychologically. In their classic experiment, Tversky and Kahneman observed the reversal of choice. 72% of participants in the first group chose strategy A, but 78% of participants in the second group chose strategy D. They called it the framing effect. The explanation is that when making choices under uncertainty and risk, people base their decisions on how the problem is formulated, which is irrelevant from the logical point of view. People avoid risks, but take risks to avoid losses. But wait a minute. How could Tversky and Kahneman be sure that framing effect is a thing? Could it be that the results of their experiment were due to simple chance? The choice reversal, where 72% of participants in one group choose one option, and almost the same percentage of participants in the other group choose the other option is impressive, but the sample size in this study is quite small. 72% is not 100%, so it's not like all participants are always influenced by the way the problem is phrased. So could it be that the observed result is simply due to the fact that the two groups of participants were different people to start with, and although they were randomly allocated into groups, it so happens that people in one of the groups were more risk-taking than the other group. How can we be certain that if we replicate the experiment with another sample of participants, the result will be the same? This is where statistical analysis comes into play. We cannot be completely certain, but we can estimate the chance that we're wrong. Although they don't report this in the original article, I suspect there was a rigorous test of statistical significance with the kind of data and experimental setup that they used I think they use the chi-squared test, which looks at the observed difference between groups and compares it to the difference that would be expected due to random chance alone, given the size of the groups. In small groups, it is more likely to obtain large differences due to simple chance. If groups are large, such random differences are less likely. The chi-squared test takes that into account. Any inferential statistical test results in the calculation of the p-level the probability that the observed difference between groups was obtained due to random chance. Social scientists agreed long ago that the conventional cutoff point will be 5%. That is, 
If in your experiment you have observed the difference between the experimental group and the control group, and if the probability that this kind of difference is due to random chance is less than 5%, then you consider this result to be statistically significant. And you say, look, there is a difference between the two groups. However, if you observed a certain difference, but your estimate of the probability that this difference was observed by random chance is larger than 5%, then you conclude that the difference is not statistically significant. In other words, you have to conclude that there is no difference between the two groups. Once you calculate the chi-squared coefficient for this data, which I did, you get chi-squared equals 76.3 with one degree of freedom. To determine how likely it is to obtain this value by pure chance alone, you look at this table, from which we can see that for one degree of freedom, our result, 76.3, lies well beyond the 10.83 cutoff point that is reported for the probability level p less than 0.001. This means that the probability of obtaining this result by random chance is less than one tenth of one percent. So the difference is highly statistically significant. So there is indeed a non-random difference between the experimental group and the control group in this experiment. So to link it back to the essay question, we are rarely completely certain, but we are frequently certain enough. Results of this experiment are not absolutely certain. There exists a chance that they were obtained due to random factors. However, we are using probabilistic logic and the mechanics of statistical inference. And this gives us the possibility to estimate the chance that our result is wrong. If this chance is less than 5%, then it is good enough for us to accept the results of this study as true. That's what social scientists have agreed upon. So we're never completely certain, but we're frequently certain enough. Now, remember I said that one of my examples would not be appropriate for TOK and the other one would. Which one of these examples do you think is the good one and which one do you think is the bad one? Think a little and formulate a response in your head and in 10 seconds, I will tell you what I think. I think the second example about statistical inference is good. I think the first example about heuristics, System 1 and System 2 thinking, is bad. Note how both these examples are essentially about the same thing, human thinking and decision making but they approach it from two different angles. The first example talks about human thinking and decision-making in itself, which is human behavior. It is a first-order example, an example about the world. It is subject-specific to psychology. It is not about knowledge. It would be appropriate for a psychology essay, but not a TOK essay. The second example is about researchers and how they investigated something. It is focused on answering the how do we know what we know question. It is not about human decision making, it is about our knowledge of human decision making. This makes it a second order example, not an example about the world, but an example about our knowledge about the world. You really need to feel the difference in order to make sure that what you're writing in your essay is actually TOK. Thanks for watching, don't forget to check out our TOK resources, such as our TOK textbook, the free menu of lessons, the downloadable lesson plans, YouTube playlist, and so on. All links are in the description below the video. See you next time!